I used to think that the problem of transportation was efficiency. I no longer believe that. I'm a convert to something known as Jevons paradox, the idea that as you get things more efficient, there tends to be more use of that thing. Okay, makes sense. The original idea was, oh, steam engines are getting less, more efficient, we're gonna need less coal. But instead what happened is coal consumption dramatically increased yeah, yeah. because a more efficient engine was applicable in more categories, you use more of them, and people started figuring out other ways to use them for new purposes. That same thing happened with efficiency of transportation. Welcome everyone to our latest episode of Climb by VSC. I'm so excited to have Sunil Paul here. He's a former client of mine that I helped you all um, when you were launching Spring Free EV, which we're going to dig into in a little bit. But you're an OG in ride sharing. You started uh, Sidecar, which rivaled Uber and Lyft. And then you incubated Get Around. You've had a, just an interesting background, even working in DC, uh, on the like mostly like as an engineer on that side. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, um, when I was in DC, I actually had three different careers. I first was a NASA contractor. Uh, it's amazing, fun, exciting work to help with early space station design. Um, and then I was very interested in policy, so I became a technology policy analyst, uh, worked on Capitol Hill for a, an agency, uh, doing really interesting work around nanotechnology and, and where that was headed. And then, um, and then got a job with America Online as the first internet product manager back when the internet just needed one product. <laughs> Wait, and you were really number one? Yeah. It's incredible. I didn't even know that. Well, we're going to get started actually with a couple of rapid fire questions. Okay. First one's from right. my favorite podcast, which is done by The Skim. Uh, so I'm actually ripping this question for them because I love it. But what was okay. the first job you ever had and got paid for? Well, let's see. I suppose job, I was, uh, I was uh, selling computers at back when computer stores were, were a thing. Um, and uh, I guess they are now a thing again, but they're, you know, dedicated to Apple mm -hmm. or whoever, Microsoft. Um, but, you know, I've always been, I was always the kid that came to your door selling something. <laughs> I was selling Christmas cards and candies. And um, my, my favorite experience was selling something that actually nobody wanted. Uh, in suburban Tennessee, I was selling uh, subscriptions to the Grange, or was it Granger? So it was the Grange, which is a farm, like magazine, magazine farm <laughs> newspaper. I don't know how I got in my head that anybody would be interested <laughs> in it. Probably because they paid a lot in commission or whatever. But um, anyway, I was not very successful at that one, but I kind of enjoyed it. I liked reading through it, and I was, <laughs> so I was uh, trying to get people to buy it. <laughs> would you say you were a natural salesman? In hindsight, yeah. And yeah. just because, you know, the most important thing about a salesperson is just the willingness to knock on the next door, yeah. pick up the phone, get in front of somebody. And yeah. that never was, I was never intimidated by that. So, Okay, I love that. Um, let's talk about some of your startup. Another question for our lightning round is startup ideas that you did or didn't do that still haunt you. Yeah. Well, let's see. First of all, I've, Looking back at my various startups, I've realized that most of them have their origins uh, many years before I actually do it. Um, with the exception of Brightmail, um, the anti-spam uh, email security company, that one kind of happened pretty fast, but I mean, like only six months or a year. But all the others, they kind of kick around in my head for a long time. So I've, I've actually got one right now that's kicking <laughs> out of my head that I gave a presentation on four or five years ago, um, shortly, shortly after Sidecar, just thinking about the implications of autonomy in how we could organize urban transportation. And um, I still think there's a there there, but I think often timing is everything. Yeah. And so, you know, everyone talks about you can't time markets, but in fact, in fact... <laughs> The number one key is timing. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Anyway, I I don't think the time is right for okay. this particular idea. So you're gonna wait it out a little bit longer? Is that your? Yeah. Or you know, I don't know. Maybe I'll try to convince others to go do it. Mm. I tried to convince people to go do the company I'm doing yeah. now. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't get anybody to really go do it, and so yeah. I'm like, okay, it's actually 
after lots and lots of iteration, got to a point where like, oh, this actually makes sense as, yeah. a, as a significant company. And um, okay, so I got to go do it. Let's right. go do it. Where do you get most of your ideas from? You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's, I think, classic innovation, which is understanding, first, deeply respect the problem, go go deep on it. So like the very, very good advice, starting with Steve Blank and others, about like get yourself in front of someone who can represent the problem, the customer. Um, and then second, be aware of all the different widgets that you've got, all the different tools you've got to try to solve that problem. Because the more you understand about that, the more ways you can configure things. Right. And the more those ideas are like Lego blocks, the easier it is to come up with a solution. If they're not like Lego blocks, in other words, it's not easy to kind of pull up something off the shelf in order to integrate it. It makes it harder. And sometimes you have to go create some of those Lego blocks. Yeah. Um, but almost all the innovations in the world come from putting different pieces together. Often they are they seem like, wow, how is that even possible? That seems so miraculous. But in fact, they tended to be taking existing pieces and putting them together. Right. Um, the first um, communication satellite, right, it had solar cells. It had the ability to communicate radio signals all the way from Earth and back. Like mind-boggling kind of technology at the time. And it seemed, and it was, a significant breakthrough. But it was not a breakthrough of, oh, we developed all these things just for this. Right. AT&T Bell Labs had already developed the solar cell. Mm -hmm. AT&T Bell Labs also had developed something called the tra traveling wave tube, which is still used in satellite communications. Uh, and being able to combine that uh, was what enabled, uh, oh, sorry, transistor two, another minor invention. Um, but combining all that allowed the creation of the first communication satellite. Right. It's like mind blowing. <laughs> you could have a, a telephone call from one continent to the other. Like, holy cow. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I'm actually very interested in this topic. Yeah. Where does innovation come from? You're always coming up with so many ideas. I mean, would you prefer to be the idea maker? Do you or do you want to actually like be operating these, or do you want to just come up with the ideas and then find the person to go build it? Kind of like um, like like yeah, you know like there's like super like studios that you just yeah incubate. Like yeah. I don't know. What do you think about that? Uh, I definitely like the ideation phase. It's a lot of fun, uh, and I think in my early career I would have said, oh yeah, I'm definitely just the idea person. Yeah. But as I've gone through the different companies and and also sat on boards. First of all, the idea is never the thing that ends up working. Yeah. It always takes uh, ongoing iteration. And uh, and so if you're not actually involved in that process, it's hard to it's hard to actually see something big in the world. Right. So and that's number one. Number two is, man, I really like working with teams and great yeah. people and engaging other people's creativity and getting that all wrapped up in it. Like that is, that's joyous. Mm -hmm. And um, I, over the years I've just discovered that's as joyous as <laughs> the, the ideation itself. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't think I would, it's, it's not as satisfying to just, I mean, I've thought about being just a VC. Yeah. And, and I do it like in between companies I focus on investing um, and I'm good at it, but <laughs> like it's just not as satisfying mm -hmm. as actually turning something from this nebulous idea to reality in the world. Right. Where did your, can I say call it an obsession with wanting to reinvent transportation come from? Because <laughs> for the last 15 years or so, that's what you've been working on in various ways. How did yeah. all that start for you? You know, I've wondered the same thing because people, I mean, at first I didn't really realize that I was so uh, obsessed or so, <laughs> yeah. so thought about it so much. Um, but in fact, if you look at not just the things I've done, but the things I think about, um, a lot of it is around transportation. And so it maybe it has something to do, like when I arrived in the United States, I was four years old. It was... You know, a flight from India, I think through London or New York, 
to Oklahoma City wow. in 1969. Like, and it was wintertime. There was a mix-up in who was going to be picking us up. Okay. So there's no one at the airport. Yeah. We took a cab ride okay. to, uh, to Stillwater, Oklahoma. Wow. And uh, where my father was a grad student. And one of the things that like really struck me coming from yeah. uh, a rural town in India, Ferozpur, in the middle of Punjab, uh, on the edge of Punjab now, um, is just how many cars there were. Mm-hmm. And and that's in a snowstorm <laughs> yeah. in Oklahoma, yeah. like, you know, between Oklahoma City and Stillwater. I was like, wow, there's so many cars. Uh-huh. Um, of course, it was hardly any cars. <laughs> But yeah, so yeah. from an early age, I just had this like, wow, what's this thing going on with all these cars? Yeah. It's a unique American phenomena, like the number of cars there's mm-hmm. and the uh, importance of cars in kind of American culture and society. And uh, it's not the, quite the same. It's really just US, Canada, Australia have right. a particular a deep integration with the automobile in a way that other countries really don't. Um, largely because we're spread out geographically and um, and also, you know, reasonably wealthy co- countries. So uh, it, it allows for a much more car-centric world. Now that culture has been spread to really the entire world now where you're seeing the same kind of phenomena of, uh, you know, suburb- suburbs, uh, sort of culture and the layout of cities really designed around cars. Um, as much as there's been pushback against that, it's still the dominant paradigm. Right. So what do you think we haven't solved yet with with transportation? I mean, there's probably so many issues. Yeah. So I used to think that the problem was efficiency, that we could apply information technology to the way that people coordinate around cars and buses and and trains and use that to increase the density, increase the number of people per car, um, and that that was the solution. That was the most rapid solution to having impact on climate. Uh, I no longer believe that. Okay. In fact, I I believe I'm a convert to something known as Jevons Paradox, the idea that as you get things more efficient, uh, there te- there tends to be more use of that thing. Okay, makes sense. Jevons was a, I think, an economist in the Industrial Revolution. There was an idea that as we got more and more efficient steam engines, mm-hmm. we just using, use more of it. Right. Well, the original idea was, oh, steam engines are getting less, more efficient. We're going to need less coal. Yeah. But instead, what happened is coal consumption dramatically increased. Yeah. yeah. Because a more efficient engine was applicable in more categories. You, use more of them, and people started figuring out other ways to uh, to use them for new, pe- new purposes. That same thing happened with efficiency of, of transportation. So, you know, we came up with this innovation of, of ride sharing, which, by the way, was the original idea was to somehow create this idea of like a shared experience of, uh, of taking rides. And in order to simplify the problem, in order to get to market with something that was compelling, we came up with ride sharing. And that idea that you can have this kind of dispatchable through cell phones uh, or uh, smartphones um, network of drivers has both increased the number of, of vehicles, has increased the, the number of um, uh, trips that people take mm-hmm. through that kind of kind of taxi like uh, transportation instead of transit or their own car. That's where it's maybe a positive uh, impact, and it's caused a change in land use. In other words, the mission used to be a transportation desert. Right, it was very hard to to move around. Parking was really hard. Now, one of the reasons why it's become more gentrified is because of rideshare. It's not the only reason, but it is a reason. In other words, and by the way, it's also had all kinds of positive impacts, right? You can get you can get rides in in Hunters Point that you yep. couldn't before. So 
But what I'm trying to say is that that efficiency has caused an increase in the use of that service. Okay, so what's the problem? The problem we really need to solve is the climate problem. And transportation is a huge portion of the overall um, greenhouse gas emissions, about 16% worldwide. And in the United States, it's, uh, I think, about 30%. And in California, it's now the majority of emissions. So figuring out how to get uh, transportation to lower emissions profiles is one of the keys, one of the important unlocks mm -hmm. for solving the climate crisis, crisis. And by the way, there is no one single unlock. Anybody who tells you, oh, we're going to do it with nuclear, we're going to do it with carbon sequestration, they, <laughs> they do not know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, so one of the important unlocks is, is trans transportation. And electrification is the uh, very clear answer for a lot of different reasons. The, the core of which is we've got lithium ion uh, batteries on a regular declining cost curve. Um, you know, generally these are learning curves. Improved energy density, cost per kilowatt hour, it's all improving. And um, the power electronics that are also very important for uh, the powertrain are, are getting better more affordable, et cetera. So that is the driver behind it all. There's an added benefit mm -hmm. that if we have all these batteries and we can properly coordinate them, we could actually um, not only get more on the grid than we currently think, but we could actually use all that battery power mm -hmm. in a positive way to help control for the intermittency of the grid. Solar and wind, very intermittent. You don't always know when the sun's going to shine, right. when the wind's going to uh, blow. But if we had storage, we had widespread storage, it could solve that problem. Now, that's like long-term solution. Um, but I think that uh, electrification of transportation is such an important uh, component because of those two things. Mm -hmm. It can both eliminate a big chunk of emissions uh, just that come directly from tra transportation and it can help enable even more renewables on the grid because of all that storage capacity. Right. So I see it as a, as a, a very instrumental piece of the, of the overall equation. Now, in addition to this, we also need to be able to have a, do a better job of land use and how our cities are planned and yeah. like all of that's a mess too. Um, but like <laughs> trying to solve the climate crisis by, uh, getting people not to drive. Right. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Like, exactly. We need the climate crisis solved, you know, in a decade, 15 years. Like we can't, we can't wait to dramatically change consumer behavior. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's largely why, um, that is the reason why I started Spring Free EV mm -hmm. um, is because we think these there's unique aspects of the electric vehicle that are totally different than traditional gas and electric. And the the goal for our company is to unlock those advantages. Yeah. They are in some ways hiding in plain sight. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like we all kind of know these things, but uh, it is... Uh, our job is okay. So we th see we see three advantages that that are not widely understood and definitely not in fossil fuel mm -hmm. cars. One is even though they cost more upfront, electric vehicles cost less over their lifetime. Right. Second is there are tremendous government support programs, but they're hard to get access to. They're often confusing. They're overlapping, not overlapping. They come in and out of capability. And third, there's this ability to interact with the grid. So all these are advantages that the existing fossil fuel cars just can't, don't even contemplate. At the same time, there's a vulnerability. Like the battery is around 40% of the value of an electric car. And if uh, if we're going to like allow electric cars to, to scale very dramatically around the world, then we need to protect that asset. Right. So that's what we're doing is we're unlocking 
in inventing ways to unlock those advantages and protect the downside. Right. And you're starting with fleets. So for anyone who is like not familiar at home, Spring Free EV is helping fleet owners be able to shift from gas to electric vehicles, and you offer it through better financing, That's right? right? That's right. And so why did you start with fleets? Or how did you know to start with fleets? Was this just, just did you talk to like the general consumer first, or where did, where did you go? Yeah, um, we've talked to a lot of people by now. It's, um, you know, with the early phases of this idea. So this idea, too, had its roots way long ago. Um, some people might remember Better Place. It was an effort to try to create uh, swappable batteries. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember learning about it and learning about the, the, the economics of it and thinking to myself, well... It's kind of dumb. Like, why why take all that effort to swap the batteries out? Why not? Can't you kind of financially engineer a way to extract the battery? Mm -hmm. um, actually, I thought maybe you could apply it to hybrid vehicles because there weren't any pure electric vehicles back then, or lit very very few. Um, and so, the original version of the idea was: could you do it with hybrids? And I didn't think. There was enough of a there there um, that I've continued to think about it in the yeah. back of my head. Does that, I mean, sidecar and other things are going on in the meantime. Um, so I've talked to a lot of people over, you know, the last now about 10 years um, about their willingness yeah. to what well, basically comes down to are you willing to pay a small fee per mile um, in exchange for a large discount up front? And both because it's kind of a new concept uh, and in the consumer world, the you don't want someone who's just going to put it in their garage and never drive it. Yeah, that's true. If you're going to charge per mile, well, you want someone who's going to put a lot right. of miles on. Yeah. So, uh, so fleets are a good fit for that because they tend to put a lot of miles on. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about fleets is that they are very economically focused. They're not as focused on, you know, what's the color of the vehicle or, I don't know, can does it have four-wheel drive so I can get to Tahoe or whatever. Right. Um, or, you know, does it have... Yeah, the, the nice interior, all yeah. the bells and whistles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the stuff I love, but <laughs> it's... Uh, but that's less... But it's really moving from point A to B or like moving people or products or goods. Or goods. Yeah. 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 And so they are, because they're more economically focused... Uh, this idea of paying per mile offset by the fuel cost and your savings in fuel and maintenance um, is uh, is more attractive, easier to sell. Now, our goal is to to build a big head of steam behind the early market. So, the, our early market is small, medium sized fleets, um, and think you know everything from small rental fleets. Um, small limo fleets, um, small corporate fleets, like someone who may be a solar installer that has 20 or 30 vehicles, um, and other categories like uh, taxis and um, uh, small fleets of, of rideshare uh, uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, what we also discovered is that those... Uh, types of fleets it's actually the biggest category of fleets wow. i didn't know this either until yeah. digging into it turns out two-thirds of the fleet vehicles are in the united small states are small medium-sized vehicles are small yeah. me yeah. small medium-sized fleets yeah because when you say fleet everyone's like oh yeah like okay. hertz car rent hertz. have like ten thousand tesla's <laughs> right. yeah exactly but that's only one third, all of them together is a third are one third of the fleet vehicles in the United States. So are these, so you would say they're like, I wouldn't, I don't want to call them like mom and pop, but yeah, they're, some of them are. Yeah, some are. And so they're renting, they're buying EVs through, are they buying the EV through you or how does that work? How do you, mm -hmm. how do you go in and help them? Yeah. I mean, typically what we're doing is we're, we're we are leasing the vehicle to them. So we, uh, acquire it. Um, you know, think Tesla's and, uh, we were doing bolts until they're discontinued. Um, but also other other kinds of electric vehicles. And we are leasing it out on, there's a fixed monthly and there's a, an, a mileage fee 
that mileage fee is pretty modest. Yeah. Um, you know, think anywhere from seven cents to at the top end, 25 cents. All of those uh, mileage fees are offset by the fact that, you know, you're spending much less on gas, much less on maintenance than you would be on a regular car. Um, and, you know, what our customers love about it is they can expand their fleet. It's a, a, it's a lease, not a, not a loan. So right. um, if they want, they can turn in the car at the end of one year, three years, five years, uh, or they can, they can buy it out. It uh, gives them that flexibility. And by the way, the, the expense is tax deductible. Um, and this is a way to expand their fleet in a way that um, wouldn't be possible right. if they just went out and got their own, like a personal loan or whatever. Uh, so we're able to add 10, 20, 30, 40 uh, vehicles to a fleet, whereas that owner might otherwise only be able to add two or three or four. Um, so that is is working well. Um, we also just introduced something else, which is for anybody who's familiar with renewable finance, they'll know about something called tax equity. Okay. For anyone who it's not. I don't know. Tell me about it. <laughs> Tax equity is like, what are you talking about? I instantly hear my finance husband like duh, 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 yeah. telling me words. I'm like, oh, yes. It I'm is, not- uh, when I first got into renewable energy, it took me years to get my head around tax equity. Yeah, I was just always, uh, anyway, it's honestly not that complicated. There are all these tax credits out there, especially federal tax credits, but not everybody can take advantage of the tax credit. Right. If you don't pay taxes, you can't take advantage of a tax credit. So this is basically a mechanism, set of legal and financial structures that allows somebody else who does pay taxes and wants to take that tax credit to step in with some capital. Think, you know, if it's a $7,500 tax credit, somebody might be stepping in for, say, $5,000 of, mm-hmm. of capital. Now, that capital is supposed to be paid back. It's not a replacement for the credit. But it's at a very affordable price point. Now, sometimes that could be much more. It could be $10,000 instead of Um, $75,000. The the details matter. It depends on the circumstance. But this is a, in renewable, this started out as a little uh, interesting side thing. Yeah. Uh, It's now about a $40 billion business in, uh, you know, solar wind storage and growing very rapidly. Uh, we're the first to have developed it in the world of electric vehicles. Interesting. And looking for, uh, now we're talking to a bunch of different companies about how to scale it up in a much mm-hmm. bigger way. I want to go back a little bit for a second because you talked about Better Place, which we know flamed out. I think they had raised like almost a billion or even probably more than a billion. And we had uh, a gentleman, Levi Tillman, who's VP of Policy from Ample, who does battery swapping here in the Bay Area and internationally as well. But uh, like uh, what I learned through Ample was that for fleets, like they don't have access to overnight charging. So I'd love to hear like your perspective on that. If you if you even think like if you were inspired by Better's Place, like is there still do you foresee a way that battery swapping makes sense? Battery swapping is widespread in material handling. Mm-hmm. Think forklifts and you know moving stuff around on factory floors. Uh, and it's been used for a long time. Yeah. So. There is a role for battery swapping in um, in electric vehicles. Um, like I said, it's been going on for a long time using yeah. acid batteries. Uh, figuring out how to do it with lithium ion and with uh, uh, larger vehicles, uh, there's probably there's probably a, an opportunity there. Unclear to me exactly what the configuration is. Um, I talked to a recent company that um, that's doing a I'm actually not sure how public they are about what they're doing, but they're doing a, a very interesting form of battery swapping for large, you know, like uh, semi-trucks. Oh, fascinating. That yeah. makes a lot of sense too, but probably really difficult to do that given how heavy the batteries would have to be or how many of them you would need to have on such a big, yeah, moving vehicle. Yeah. They fascinating. Have some, some clever ideas on how to do that. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit now also around Spring Free. So... What's like in the pipeline for you guys? Like what? Like what's ahead? Well, um, 
growth. <laughs> uh, we're now at a phase of company where we are, you know, there's like early product market fit, but then there is a a phase of a company where you are you're trying to get to like uh, the huge takeoff, yeah, uh, hyper hyper growth kind of scale up, and it's a version of product market fit. Mm-hmm. You're still adapting your your product offering to get to that point where it's just you know growing like crazy, right? And so you know we've got very good growth, but we don't have like the crazy growth, yeah, and. I've experienced crazy growth in America Online, going way back when. Yeah, I joined just as the crazy growth was going. I I can't claim responsibility <laughs> for. You know, mostly it was about. Yeah, those are the days with CD ROMs. Exactly. <laughs> Put in it, and everyone was going to. Uh, what was the What was the computer store? Why can't I think of what it was? And we were kids. Was it uh, like PC something? I don't PC World. No, is that funny? You can't remember. I can't remember, but I remember going. Yeah. To the computer store. And we would like get the floppy desk and the, or the, the yeah. CD. Out here, of course, it was fries, but there was another one. Yeah. It was one and I don't have the East so it's yeah. different. Yeah, but, I can't remember any. Yeah. Yeah. So there was that. And there was, um, I mean, my role there was the internet, getting yeah. the internet on board and getting all that to work. Right. Accelerated the growth. And uh, of course, with ride sharing, you know, we knew well, it was right a, away. It was great timing. It was like that with the iPhone and then just like the freedom that you had. And it just, it was like a perfect time. Yeah. And we knew right away, this is it's like, it's already taking off. Yeah. It's just like, how do we keep up? You know, unlike say, Brightmail, Brightmail email security company, we spent many years yeah. figuring out how do we get to very rapid uh, growth. It took us like, four years before we how do you remain patient it's not about patience it's about kind of keeping um keeping clear on why are you doing it in the first yeah. place because mm-hmm. you know i there is a very clear climate impact that right me and the other co-founders are all after mm-hmm. and uh that's that and the the great team like those yeah. are the things that i I'm excited to get out of bed and like, okay, yeah, what are we gonna do? Like, we there's and no, I'm not patient. Have you found that it's been easy or difficult to find investors and partners that are share that same why as you in this environment? You know, I think that's actually one of the big changes. Uh, the short answer is yes. There's lots of investors out there that are at least at the very highest level motivated by climate and. Uh, maybe just as important, their investors are motivated by climate. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, I saw an estimate recently that worldwide, there's something like 6,000 climate or th- uh, investment firms that have some sort of climate connection. Right. Um, and that includes equity and debt and later stage and early stage and, you know, all the different flavors. Uh there's a lot. Not. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. I mean, and certainly compared to Clean Tech 1.0, where I think I knew all of them. Yeah. I'm constantly running into new ones. Yeah. It's amazing. I know. It's yeah. Amazing. Your spreadsheet of people to target and people to know is probably growing. Yeah. 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 I feel that. It's great. And that I th- it, all this, all the additional capital coming into the sector is so vital. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, frankly, a lot of people are. They're going to learn hard lessons because <laughs> it's, it's not an easy sector. Yeah. But um, but we need, and look, venture capital's risk capital. A lot of it's going to get lost. True. Um, so uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, sort of crying any tears for them. It's just um, it, it is, it's necessary that we have all that capital come into the sector. Uh, I, I do worry a little bit maybe because of clean tech 1.0. Yeah. I do worry a little bit about too many people losing money. Okay, true. And it causing a pullback yeah. in in capital in the in the sector. Um but that could just be just you know excessive scar tissue for <laughs> <laughs> clean tech 1.0. <laughs> 
what advice would you have for founders who are building today based on all of your lessons learned from, you know, probably six companies at this point that you? Uh, ones that I've founded yeah. on four. Right. Okay. Um, and then I've been involved in founding or boards or right. investment or whatever. And I'm over 100 at this point. My gosh. So just like a, a final parting advice yeah, for that I mean, they build. Honestly, the probably the thing that so I've always been very focused, as I was saying earlier, on like admire the problem, be willing to engage with the problem, don't be afraid to knock on the door. That hasn't changed. I think probably what has changed is the m- much more relentless focus on team. Oh. And yeah, I've always been aware of it, but team and culture and uh, like all those things really matter. Yeah. I used, admittedly, I used to laugh at the the idea. There's this kind of you know, culture eats strategy for yeah. breakfast. I'd be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> that was honestly my attitude. Mm-hmm. I don't know, ten years ago, and I'm like, it's such- 180 degrees the opposite. Like, culture is is very very important, and it. Then you got to have the right strategy, I suppose. If I had to. If I had to choose one, I would in fact choose the right <laughs> strategy. <laughs> but yeah, a culture that it's kind of like I'd rather bet on a great team with a good idea than you know a great idea and just an okay team. Exactly, because a great team will take that good idea and iterate on it until it's great. Yeah. A great idea in the hands of a mediocre team, they'll just. They'll throw it away. Exactly. They will not respond to the right signals and all that. So, right. so kind of the same thing with culture. Like, great strategy, mediocre culture, it's going to die. Yeah. You know, good strategy with a great culture. And what does culture mean? It means, like, I'm also a fan of archaeology and um, spent a lot of time thinking and reading about sociology, anthropology, archaeology, and... So uh, one of the archaeologists, uh, I read a book, he boiled down, I don't know if this is common or not. Anyway, cu- boiled down culture to uh, two things, stories and rituals. Oh, yeah. Like, okay. And I thought about that. There are, it's important to have, um, it, you know, by stories, I don't mean made up stuff. Yeah. I mean, like, what are the things that you reinforce that you talk about over and over again. Think about your family or any other kind of culture that you build. There are certain stories you tell over and over again. Well, those stories are really important. Like what matters? What doesn't matter? Um, similarly, rituals. Like what are the things that you're going to do repeatedly? What are the things that everybody knows? Oh, it's Thursday. We're going to talk about what went well. Yeah. Oh, it's Monday. We've got our... I mean, these are kind of normal things for a company to do, but um, you know, there are some things we're doing unique at at Spring for EV. You know, things like we don't have time to get into all this, but decision cards and um, and our our modified fast sprint uh, process. Cool. Uh, and those are all part of the culture of the company. Yeah, because they are part of the rituals that 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 we engage in. And I love to hear that it's coming from you at the top because it really sets the tone. It's even like in, like in your family and you're growing up, but like, okay, if your mom or dad came home from work with a bad day, like the whole night dinner was ruined. And that's because it comes from your parents. And so like in the in the case of the workplace, like when you are setting this tone and you're like hell bent on having this really great culture, it inspires everybody else. We do something similar to like at our firm on Fridays, we call it a fresh Friday and we meet every morning, every Friday at 8.30 and we do, we start out with shout outs and we're like, so and so, like, thanks for helping me do this. Love that you helped me do this. Like, That's it great. is like the best part of the week because you're just spending, like, sharing love with everybody, and it just like makes going into the weekend even better. I and like it builds that. the culture because we're all remote. There's 35 of us in all these different states, but it's our one time all to get together and just say like, thank you for helping me this week to get through whatever it was. You want to do a podcast just on yes. remote culture awesomeness yes exactly and we talked at the beginning of this actually doing a therapy session <laughs> podcast founder therapy which so like, we should bring that into all of this yeah 
What about someone on your team that you felt like you should have hired earlier, but you didn't? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to turn around a little bit. I've observed that um, both at Spring Free EV and at Brightmail, early on, we really focused on uh, people, recruiter. In the case of Brightmail, we had a, a an actual recruiter who helped us find great engineering talent. And at Spring Free EV, there's a, a co-founder who's a, our chief people officer. Yep. Um, and it's, I mean, first of all, he's great at helping think through and implement and operationalize culture. But also, like, he, we have really turned into, turned that sort of recruiting function into, like, a bit of a superpower of the company. Oh, yeah. And um, so it kind of goes back to the whole people team mm -hmm. thing that having somebody inside the company who um they, they, they can be a contractor but someone in in the team that is just always thinking about yeah. recruiting about team about what's the mix of people all those kinds of issues it's it makes a huge difference well i think that's a great place to leave it yeah. well thank you so much for joining us thank you this is great can't thank you enough for joining us on an episode of Climb by VSC and for our lovely guest, Sunil Paul, who joined us today. You can catch new episodes on YouTube. We also have really great clips and short ones on TikTok. We'd love it if you'd leave us a five-star review. Positive reviews, please. <laughs> and share it with your friends and anyone in your network. And we're always looking for new guests. So if it sounds like something you'd be interested in, find us online. Thanks.